Hello and welcome to Tonight at 8 from the RSGB. Most of us enjoy our hobby safely down here on terra firma, but lots of fun can be had by experimenting with radio waves and micros way above the earth using high altitude balloons for transport, as we'll find out tonight from our guest presenter Heather Nichols M0 HMO, who takes her interest in radio and computing to literally new heights. Welcome to Tonight at 8 Heather, can you give us a quick preview of what you'll be talking about this evening? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, so basically, we're going to be talking about a high altitude balloon, which is a big latex balloon, very big, uh, which uh, we put some radio kit in a bottle on the bottom of it, fly it up into, uh, oh, well, hopefully the edge of space, take some photos, get some pictures uh, of what it looks like up there, uh, do a lot of citizen science and uh, then it comes back down on a parachute. Hopefully, because of its radio position finding, we should be able to find it and uh, bring it home. Well, it sounds fantastic, and we'll look forward to finding out how you do that as well. But before your presentation, a reminder that if you at home are watching this on Monday, the 3rd of April, then this is live, and you can ask questions or make comments on either BATC or YouTube chat at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and call sign if you have one within every message. And note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. So now back to Heather to find out more about radio, computing and high altitude balloons. Well, uh, good evening everyone. Um, this is uh, slightly humorous, hopefully. Um, a project that we did a few years ago, 2017, I think we started, uh, and a little journey that we went on to uh, to get this balloon uh, up in the air and do some uh, some science. So, uh, um, just ah, there we go. Um, so the uh, spoiler here is. The this is um, a radio project that you cover uh, are doing this sort of thing. However, we are able to do a lot of radio because we do everything um, on the ISN bands, uh, Wi-Fi bands, GPS and so on. So uh, uh, there's a lot of radio, but it isn't all amateur radio. So a quick overview of what we're going to look at. Uh, overview, obviously. Um, we uh, we did this project with the Shropshire Linux Users Group with the unfortunate acronym of SLUG. And we decided originally that we were going to call the balloon the Sheep Warrior because there were a lot of sheep around and uh, there's a lot of um, a big white balloon floating around in the skies. Uh, but of course, uh, it didn't stop there. So then we went on to invent all sorts of other things, which uh, we kept the uh, sheep and farming uh, naming convention going. So uh, we'll talk about all these other weird things. We'll talk a little bit about what we did with it, with the STEM and the outreach side of it. And then finally, the pictures uh, from the balloon and uh, how it actually did its thing. So um, quick overview. Sheep Warrior is the actual balloon. So this is a big latex balloon uh, with a um, payload uh, attached to the bottom of it, which uh, will do all the radio transmitting and all the science and all the rest of it. Um, then the sheepdog, um, there's a picture of our car, I wish. Um, this is uh, this is the car that we basically, we have a radio uh, with an antenna on the roof and we rush around underneath the balloon trying to uh, keep track with it and uh, eventually when it lands we will uh, find out where it is from it's sending its gps coordinates and uh, so we yeah we rush around after it uh, we then um, decided that once it's on the ground we needed an interesting solution to actually uh, locating it from the ground because of course uh, you won't have a line of sight to it uh, which is not so good for low power radio so we invented this thing called the Sheepdog Puppy, which is basically uh, a little ground station receiver uh, that will help us find it. And um, in the event that we couldn't find it easily, we invented this thing called the Shepherd, which was a little uh, 
PCB that we had made up, uh, which will allow us to have another tethered balloon. And we'll talk a bit more about this uh, this in a minute, uh, which would then we would put up and uh, hopefully it would then have line of sight to pick up if we were having trouble uh, when we were on the ground. So um, why do it? Well, it's the edge of space, which for a lot of people is, is a really interesting place to be. Um, it's uh, we went, I think we did 32 kilometers, one of our highest. It's a pretty harsh environment. It's very cold. It's very uh, low atmospheric pressure. Um, you can do some lots of interesting science on the way up and the way down. But really, the, the big deal here is that we can do it because we can. It's another little thing to do with radio. It's fun. Uh, a little graph there just to show you that the, the, the atmospheric pressure really does drop considerably. Um, if you're uh, working in... Uh, in atmospheres, it, it's almost zero. Um, it goes down, I think, to about 50 uh, kPa. So let's talk about the, the actual uh, thing that we send up. So it's it's based on a Raspberry Pi Model A, if anyone remembers that from many years ago. Um, we've got this thing called the Pi in the Sky Tracker Board, which is basically um, a little RTTY radio board with an attached GPS receiver. And uh, so that's giving us the, the tracking. That, that's what we're receiving in order to find out where it is in the world. Uh, we built a whole load of sensors. We needed some thermal insulation because electronics and cameras, et cetera, don't like working at minus 55. Loads of software, a big balloon, a parachute so that when the balloon bursts, um, it, uh, it won't just hurtle down and land on somebody. And uh, we used a couple of pop bottles and we'll, uh, we'll uh, take a quick look at that. So uh, drink the contents of two Pepsi bottles. Uh, other brands are of them. Cut them in half so that the, uh, they can fit over each other put some string between the two. You can just see on the right-hand side of that picture, a bit of string sticking out, and that's connected to the top of the bottle. And uh, you can tie it all together. It's, this does two things. The, the interesting thing is that it provides insulation. So the sun up there, obviously there are no clouds. The sun is shining in through the uh, plastic. It heats the air inside, but as with most uh, greenhouse type effect, uh, the heat doesn't come back out. And along with the heat generated by the Raspberry Pi, uh, this should good, give quite a, a little, fair amount of um, insula insulation. So keeping the thing warm inside whilst it's minus 55 on the outside. You can see there we've got the compulsory uh, uh, reward if anyone finds it um, with uh, a little bit of packing. Um, mostly this is so that when it lands, the electronics won't jiggle around too much inside and damage itself because obviously we want it to survive the landing and keep transmitting its location. So uh, a little bit about the, uh, the vital statistics, what's actually inside this thing. Well, we've already mentioned there's a, a big latex balloon, 600 grams, so it, it's quite a heavy piece of uh, balloon. It's not your average everyday party balloon filled with helium. Um, we did think about using hydrogen um, for our first couple of attempts. We decided not to because of the risks. Uh, but helium is obviously uh, a scarce resource in the world. So we will be going to hydrogen uh, fairly soon, I think, for, for this project. Uh, the balloon is a one meter diameter. We'll see some pictures of it uh, later on at sea level. But it grows to about 10 meters uh, before it pops, hopefully at whatever, um, 25 to 30 kilometers up. Uh, we've got a total weight of balloon and payload of uh, 1.3 kilograms. So the, the Raspberry Pi and its bottle and so on don't weigh too much. We power everything from lithium batteries. Uh, you need to use lithium because they're good in temperature and they're very good for long lasting, which obviously you want if uh, things go badly and you're having trouble finding. 
we connect it all together with some nylon cord. Uh, then we come to the interesting bit, all the sensors. That's the, the diagram here. Um, I, uh, when we started in the club, I made the very silly mistake of saying, so what do we actually want to measure? And uh, a year later, I would implemented all these things. So you can see there's ambient light, UV light, magnetometers, accelerometers, atmospheric pressure sensors, more than one temperature. Yeah, the lot. Um, everything we could think of at the time we threw into this project. Um, so it took quite a long time to write all the software to control all these little electronic modules and uh, record the data and so on. But we, we got there in about a year. Um, two antennas, uh, well, actually three antennas, the GPS antenna, of course. Then we've got an FSK. So this is a 70 sem or the ISM band 70 sem FSK transmitter, uh, basically sending RITI. And we've also got a LoRa module or LoRa module, uh, which is um, low power, long range. Um, I think everything has to be under 10 milliwatts uh, for this system. So it, it's, um, it, it's quite low power, but uh, both of these modules, as you'll see, would, did quite a good job of uh, keeping everything going. So I got a latex allergy, so this wasn't the best thing for me to be uh, playing with, but there it is in its balloon, so in its bag. Um, that's uh, the big one. Um, obviously, as we said earlier, we used a smaller one for, um, uh, for, the, for the first flight. Um, lots of calculations needed to get the right amount of helium, the right amount of uh, balloon, size of balloon, the right size of parachute. It's all available online. I won't bore everybody with the maths, but uh, there were all sorts of calculators online to uh, to work this sort of thing out for you. Uh, so for the for um, adjusting this, what the way it works is you you fill helium to it until you get a certain amount of lift, and uh, once you've got that calculated amount of lift, you disconnect your uh, helium filling and you let go, and the balloon should rise up. So we we made this uh, this little apparatus here, which is basically it connects to the balloon uh, through that bit of white um, uh, plastic tubing in, in the middle there. Uh, the bottom of it connects to the filler, the, the, the helium source. And uh, we fill amount of water in that bottle, uh, which is equal to the amount of lift we want. So uh, at the point at which the whole thing just lifts off the ground, we know that we've got the right amount of lift. And then when we disconnect the bottle with its water, um, it'll uh, it'll rise up and hopefully uh, do what we want it to do. Now, the reason we went to these extremes is the first one we did, we got it wrong and it didn't go up as fast as we had hoped. So it, it was actually in the air for, I think it was about four hours. And it went a lot further uh, than we expected. We launched it in the middle of Shropshire. Uh, we expected it to go 100 miles or so. It actually ended up uh, in the outskirts of London. So uh, we, we designed this bit just so that we wouldn't have that problem again. Uh, so there's an example of some of the, uh, the helium. You can get lots of different sources of helium. That's uh, one we used for our second uh, helium fill. Uh, we used a standard helium bottle for the first one. So uh, my worthy assistant, friend Ian, uh, holding the balloon just before we uh, released it. Um, obviously, you don't want to be touching this thing because you're going to get all sorts of oils and things from your fingers on it, which are going to potentially damage it. So we wear late latex gloves um, to, uh, to hold on to it. Um, so as you can see, it's about a meter across when it's just about ready to go. So the other things we talked about, the, um, the hardware, we've got an eight megapixel Raspberry Pi camera, all those different sensors. Uh, again, there's all the different uh, silicon modules that we used. Um, silicon sensors aren't great for low temperatures. So we had a thermocouple temperature sensor in there. Um, a little bit about battery voltage and current sensing, just because we needed to track that and transmit that. And I think I mentioned that we've got a low R radio and a uh, uh, 70 ISM band 
FSK radio. Two radios, um, both 10 milliwatts, which is the maximum you're allowed to have airborne unless you have a, an aircraft license. Um, both in the ISM band, both in the 434 megahertz area. Um, the RITI is just, uh, we went for 50 boards, 670 hertz separation is fairly standard one. Um, and we used a low resolution, um, low R transmission. So we wanted to get the most reliable signal. So the, the lowest uh, data transmission rates that we used. Um, both of these are transmitting information. Um, if you consider RITI, we transmit a transmit the dollars dollars first just to uh, say what it is then because we we didn't use an amateur call sign we called it slug for the Shropshire Linux users group and then you can see a whole load of useful information that we were uh, transmitting there's serial number of the message that's the 16 the time latitude longitude altitude um, various other things battery voltage atmospheric pressure at the end uh, so this was just a small subset of the data that we were transmitting. And right at the very end, you, that 5486 is a, uh, a checksum uh, just to make sure that the message has been received correctly. So that was the, uh, the RITI sentence. The low R sentence was similar, but we put a lot of different information in that so that between the two, uh, we should be able to collect quite a bit of the information that was being transmitted. Mentioned a bit about the software. Um, the pie in the sky was uh, de designed and written. Uh, the software was written by he lives uh, south of here, Ross on Y, I think, somewhere around there. And he's still doing balloon launches, as far as I know. So uh, he's a good guy to uh, chase up on the internet if you want to pursue this uh, further. Um, Lots of interesting things. We want auto boot and auto restart so that if things do go wrong and the batteries uh, get joggled or something and disconnect, it will always restart and get start off from where it was. So because obviously you can't reconnect batteries when you're um, 20 kilometers away from the thing. And then we did all the uh, custom code for all those sensors. We developed our own low bar code and uh, We've all put it all onto a, a big Git repository. So uh, if anyone's interested, uh, they can get in touch with me and I can point them at all the code we wrote for all of that. So then there was this interesting thing, the Shepherd. Um, so what our idea was that uh, if the balloon has landed, it's come down on its parachute, it's sitting somewhere in the middle of a, a wood, perhaps. And we're not getting good radio reception from it because we can't uh, see line of sight. Then what we'd like to be able to do is put up a tethered balloon. So this is a similar helium filled balloon, but just a small one. Um, put that up with a basically a Wi-Fi relay. So you can see on the right hand side of this board, there's a, a little 77 coil antenna. It then receives the low R. Uh, signals in that module in the middle and it then retransmits them um, through the bottom right hand SMA which is just going to a, a little uh, dangling 70 sem um, quarter wave or 5 eighths wave radio and in the middle of that uh, blue module there is a Wi-Fi module it's one of these ESP chips and so basically all this does is receives the Wi-Fi decodes, so it receives the lower, decodes it, and sets it up onto a Wi-Fi web page so that people sitting below uh, where they don't have line of sight will be able to receive the web pages from this module and uh, get all the um, the data from hopefully the line of sight which that antenna is, is giving us. So uh, this was quite a good project. We used it to learn um, about making our own custom hardware uh, in the Linux users group. And uh, so we, we did all sorts of good things like training courses for the uh, learning Eagle, which was the CAD program that we used. Uh, the thing on the top is just uh, power supply. And the thing on the right hand side, the big black thing, is just the programming module that we used to program up that uh, Wi-Fi chip. 
So the internals of this, uh, like I said, it's got a low-R module. It's got a 2.4 gig Wi-Fi module programmed with Arduino IDE, and uh, it's acting as a relay. So uh, we uh, we originally we did everything in Eagle, the CAD program, uh, but we've now moved over to uh, KiCad, which is open source. So uh, again, all of this is available if anybody wants any of it, if they're interested. So there it is. That's the the uh, website that is transmitted from this. So you can see that the the last uh, thing it received was uh, this message, and you can see the different information. Uh, in, in the bulk of that sentence. And uh, the, the website is just extracting some of that interesting information uh, for display. So um, when you're running around after this balloon, this, this is actually really good fun. Um, it's it's a, most of a day that you, you get all the fun of filling the balloon and letting it go and seeing it rush up into the air. And then sit on the uh, in the car, somebody driving, the other person with the uh, 77 antenna on the roof, receiving the, the RITI, getting it on the screen, typing it into sat navs, and it tells you where to go or working out where it is on a, on Google Maps, and uh, and then chasing around after it and trying to plot a route that keeps you uh, on the motorways because these things can move quite quickly. Um, so uh, yeah, so we we. Uh, we had it running on uh, Android mobiles. We had it running on Windows 10. We used this program, DLFL Digi. If people are familiar with digital modes. FL Digi is uh, a fairly standard uh, digital mode that does a good job of RITI. But there's a, there was a special, well, there still is a special version, the DLFL Digi, uh, which we'll, we'll mention in a bit. Um, it's quite a useful additions to that. Um, uh, to to the the Windows um, based uh, thing running on my uh, FT eight five seven in the car. We had uh, obviously we've got a, a vertical just a mag mount on the roof, uh, but we also had a another antenna which was connected to the uh, the sheepdog puppy, which we'll talk a little bit about in a moment. Um, so this is the uh, FLDG. People will be familiar with what it looks like. Um, but this little, uh, this particular version has a mode where it can retransmit the data over the internet to uh, the Hab Hub, which was, unfortunately, was um, a uh, a great resource for for helping to track these balloons. But we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So there you can see it's been receiving um, the balloon. It's uh, eight o'clock in the evening. It's received five hundred and thirty something. Uh, transmissions um, and uh, the usual witty sort of stuff. You can see uh, the, the waveform at the bottom and we've aligned the crosshairs and, and so on. So uh, this hub, hub tracker, which unfortunately isn't there anymore. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit obsolete, but it does it does demonstrate the sort of things that are going on. So uh, this this screenshot was taken towards the end of our flight. Uh, you can see uh, where we took off in the uh, in shops here, uh, just just to the south of uh, sorry to the east of Wales there, and uh, where we were when we took this uh, screenshot uh, just uh, around Reading, and all the uh, the other things you can see on here. The other circles are other balloons that are being flown. So there's uh, what one, two, three, four other balloons on that picture, um, and the green lines are receiving stations. So you can um, you see there were people up in the uh, north of the Netherlands, and uh, obviously us, and then there were people down in France as well, all who had seen that we'd announced that we were doing this flight, and had pointed their antennas in our general direction, and were receiving data. And transmitting it to this uh, this hub tub, so it's quite a great community uh, thing going on here. Quite a few people uh, helped us out in receiving it, and you can just make out on the left hand side there. There's um, it says received 16 seconds ago, and there's a list of all the people, uh, including me, who received the uh, the balloon and transmitted data in. So uh, 
yeah, it's quite quite a nice experience to do that. Now, uh, because we're flying something in the air, we need to get a uh, a license for it, um, which of course we continued our rather silly theme of calling this the dog license. So you apply to the CA, uh, take a while, come around and say, yep, uh, you, you can, uh, or where you can go and any restrictions. And obviously they worry about things like airspace. So uh, you have to be sure on the day that you actually get it. Um, to It's going to go in the right direction. So um, we mentioned what we had running uh, in the car. Uh, various people had homebrew antennas. Uh, there were, I think there were seven or eight of us did the, the tracking on the first one we ran. Uh, the RTL receiver, that, that does fine. Uh, I use, as you saw, I used my uh, A57, but little RTL with a homebrew antenna also worked fine and a uh, virtual audio cable to move stuff around inside the PC, and it, it works well. So uh, actually tracking it, you can do it for, uh, well, cost of a, a PC and uh, 20 pounds for a dongle. So uh, we tracked with SDR Sharp. Um, they can see the low bar is that big uh, square kind of um, uh, spread spectrum display on the right hand side and the bitty you can't really make it out but that's what's going on on, on the left hand side of the, uh, the waterfall and uh, yeah so that that's it, it's easy to set up easy to get it working uh, other things we did we, we wanted to know where the car had gone as well as where the balloon had gone so we created a um, position logger uh, this was basically just another gps antenna in the car with a program written in QT or Qt for those who know what that is. Um, and it just logs the car position in time. Uh, and we wrote some uh, things that will take that um, and display it on uh, uh, Google Maps and also display um, things for, um, uh, sorry, also calculate things for predicting where the balloon was going to land as it came into uh, into the uh, um, into into the ground uh, on his parachute, and uh, last thing there is that we we were also doing live position plotting on Google Maps uh, from the data that we were receiving. So top uh, left picture that's the little uh, GPS logo I made uh, that just plugs into USB, and the other thing we had was we. We've got a lot of things running on USB, so we created a, a little 12 volt battery to 5 volt um, USB hub just for providing power to everything. Uh, okay, so we mentioned this sheepdog puppy. Um, this has a low bar receiver, that's the little custom thing on a variable there, which plugs into a Raspberry Pi. It has an inclinometer and an accelerometer. That's the two things on the left-hand side picture. It has a uh, uh, Android tablet, which is displaying the information. And so the way this is designed to work is that the, uh, the little low R module receives from the balloon. It sends that information to the tablet. So the code running on the tablet now knows where the balloon is. The inclinometer and accelerometer tell you where you are pointing the antenna. They're mounted on the antenna. So now the Raspberry Pi controlling the tablet knows where the antenna is pointing. And we used a normal Android cell phone to tell the Raspberry Pi and the tablet where the um, actual antenna was, where its GPS location is. So you put all that together and you can work out where to point the antenna in order to be for it to be pointing at the, uh, the, the balloon. So this works fine when it's in the air. You, uh, you rotate it around to um, 
to point out the balloon. And uh, it also works, of course, when you're on the ground, um, you adjust everything so that you're pointing out the, uh, the balloon signal. And hopefully you should then just follow the antenna and it should lead you to it. A little bit of details there, some of the technical stuff for those interested. We used Blue NMEA to get um, data from the tablet onto the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. We use VNC running on the tablet to display stuff from the Raspberry Pi. Um, we wrote a load of custom code to run on the Pi to, to do all this uh, reading of that LoRa module, link it to the website so that we could see the uh, that data that was coming down from the uh, uh, the tethered balloon uh, in case we were needing to use that. And it was all written in GTK 2.0. Uh, and we actually created a low R test suite for this thing as well, which we uh, we took up to uh, a local hill around here and tested it um, remotely so that we could evaluate all the low R code. Uh, I2C interface for the uh, for the sensors, uh, SPI for low R, TCP for the uh, the Shepherd the gateway program, um, socket interfaces. Sentence parsers. We wrote all this stuff, so that there's quite a lot of code running on this uh, this little thing. And uh, finally, uh, that's the display you get on the um, on the the uh, tablet, um, inspired by the film Aliens. If anyone's uh, seen that, where they have a little handheld tracker and it it tells them that all the nasty aliens are about to attack them. So this we uh, we just created. So the blue dots are where the uh, the the balloon is actually being received, and the the red and the blue crosshairs are where you're actually pointing. So you just adjust the crosshairs until they are over the blue dots, and then the antenna is actually pointing at the uh, um, at the the balloon in, in the sky or on the ground. And you can see the top line there is the GPS uh, received from the uh, uh, the, the uh, NMEA, the blue NMEA uh, from the phone. The low R is what's being received if we're actually doing live low R receiving. And the ESP line is what we're receiving if we're using that, uh, the Shepherd, the, the tethered balloon. Um, to find out where it is at the uh, um, when it's landed. So uh, other stuff, we wrote some sentence parsers uh, for LoRa and FSK stuff so that we could extract all that information that we're sending uh, and get it all into Excel so that we could analyze it. And we also wrote a load of JavaScript to, to look at that um, uh, tracking the car position uh, and putting the data live on the web page. Um, and uh, you can see some of that on my website. Uh, we'll, I'll give you that uh, website at the end um, where we've got um, next things. So um, yeah, so this is the uh, uh, next generation. Where are we going to go next before we take a look at uh, some of the actual uh, results? Uh, we're currently putting together a two camera system. So we've got two cameras on two Raspberry Pis. We're going to go to Pi Zeros because they're a lot smaller and lighter. One of them will run video. The other one will do the stills that we've already seen. We've added a radiation sensor because that was the only sensor that nobody thought of to put on uh, the first time we, we flew this thing. And we've also got what what's known as a suicide low power mode where uh, if the... Um, if things are taking too much current, we could just basically turn it off and shut one of the, the Raspberry Pis down completely um, so that we could conserve battery life. And uh, because we're using low RAR, we'll have a two-way communications to this thing, and we'll be able to send up uh, commands to tell it to shut itself down and uh, just go to the, the, the battery saving mode. And uh, the last thing is we'll talk about a little bit about this Radio Son website. So I mentioned that uh, the Hab Hub had been shut down. 
But luckily, uh, some guys who are tracking radio sons, which are the weather balloon uh, radio transmitters, have taken this over. And now you can go on to the, uh, this amateur dot sond hub and do roughly the same thing, but on that website. So we'll be transmission, transitioning all of our stuff over to use that so that we can get the benefit of other people uh, doing the, the uh, receiving and sending it all back to a central hub. Okay, so uh, here's some results. First off, we decided to do play safe. So rather than flying it up into the air on its own balloon, we just uh, put it on board a hot air balloon, which was doing a route for uh, some people in, in the Telford area. Initial track that it took from the GPS. So it starts in the, uh, the little red pointer there uh, where we parked up the car, turned on the, the tracker. We uh, walked around in the field with it. You can see on the left-hand side where we loaded it onto the actual balloon gondola and uh, it hung around there for a while and then the balloon took off and went over the uh, over the buildings and off to the right of the picture. So uh, that was our first real evidence that the thing was working, doing its job. Um, and uh, we could also test out our software to make sure that it was all uh, uploading onto Google Street View or whatever and uh, working well. So since then, we've tracked other balloons. We tracked Barnaby in 2017 and Space Camp 2018. We do quite a lot of STEM reach, outreach events. Uh, the kids quite like the idea of this balloon and the, like the pictures that we'll show you. Um, we've done uh, the Cosford Air Show a couple of times, the Telford uh, 50 celebrations, uh, 50 years of Telford, which is where we did that uh, balloon flight. And then <laughs> the next year they did Telford 51 with the balloon flight. Uh, we've uh, tracked our payload on a few air, hot air balloons and we've also done the real flights. So uh, we're hoping to get this thing out there, uh, get people interested and uh, see what we're doing and, and, and get get inspired to do some radio or uh, alt high altitude balloons or that sort of thing. So uh, there's a demonstration we put on at Cosford. Uh, you can see some pictures, uh, of the, the receiving station in the big screen there. And uh, on the right hand side, you've got the uh, um, pictures of the balloon and the actual uh, modules and uh, things like that. So uh, we also did one of the Telford uh, ham fests. That's the actual payload on the right, just in the in the bottle without the uh, all the padding and so on. The thing in the middle is this uh, sheepdog puppy. So there's our uh, little display on the uh, tablet, and uh, the the thing is all mounted on a tripod, and you can't see it in that picture, but there's a little hand, uh, little yagi on top of the tripod. So. Uh, you uh, move the tripod around or uh, move the Yagi around on the tripod and line up those crosshairs as we've discussed. And then you uh, you actually receive the, the actual signal. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see the uh, display from uh, our uh, shepherd. That's the tethered balloon telling us where it is as well. So, OK, on this particular instance, we know where it is because we can see it on the bench. but. Uh, we proved out that all the systems are working and uh, doing what they should do. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to track it. So one of the flights we put hot air balloon, uh, we put the, the payload on the outside of the hot air balloon. And I'm rather pleased with that picture. Um, obviously, we were one of the first ones to go, but there's all the others down in that uh, field that we uh, saw on Google Maps earlier. And uh, yeah, we got some quite good pictures. So uh, done all that. It was all working. And so we did our first flight, Slug One. And uh, now we'll have a quick look at the pictures that uh, we got from that. So first picture, that was the balloon. There's its parachute. Um, it's just sitting on the table waiting to have some uh, 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 helium put in the balloon and, and ready to fly off over the UK. And we let go, and there it is. So you've got the balloon up top right-hand side, obviously. 
uh, quite a lot of nylon cord. It has to be particular breaking strain nylon so that if a plane uh, flies into it, it won't do any damage. You've got the parachute uh, a little way down from the balloon. And the balloon isn't shown on that picture. Um, there it is. The balloon just come off the ground and the parachute quite a long way away from it. So, uh, again, you need a reasonable length so that you can, A, stabilise the thing, and B, so that if a plane flew into it, it would snap it rather than uh, get tangled up in it or anything. And it, it is, it, it's reasonably good nylon cord, but it will break um, and it meets all the, the CAA's requirements for uh, for what you do. So here's the pictures from the, the Raspberry Pi camera. So that's a picture of our farm where we let go. And uh, then uh, that's uh, the Rekin, if anybody knows that in Shropshire. So this is uh, getting up towards the first cloud layer. There we passed the first cloud layer. Um, so it's, it's uh, I don't know why this was probably eight, 10,000 feet. Going up further still. And uh, there we're actually, we're getting quite high now. You can start to see the sky is darkening. Um, that's, uh, that's getting quite high up. Um, Again, we're now above the upper cloud layer. You can see that superimposed on the, the wispy clouds. And uh, that's one of my favorite pictures, not because the picture is particularly good, but because if you look at the top right hand side, you can see the moon. So uh, yeah, that gives you a, a vague idea of the scale of the thing and uh, a little bit of a, a astronomical picture from uh, quite high up. So uh, you remember we were tracking it with that tracking program. And when it went into the jet stream at about uh, 20,000 meters, 20 kilometers up, it did this little wiggle um, just... Uh, just outside uh, Oxford, I think. Um, so yes, interesting trace that you can see. It, it, uh, it was flying along and then it went round and round in circles. And then it got off, uh, down towards uh, London, as, as I may go that far, but uh, it did because we, we didn't get enough helium in it. So we were parked up somewhere near Oxford when it did that. Uh, went up a bit higher. It burst, I think this one was 24 kilometers up. And then it started coming down. And it comes down on the parachute. It comes down a lot quicker than it goes up. But we were quite relieved when we uh, when we realized that it was actually coming down because uh, the uh, some of the predictions we had said it might have landed in the channel. Um, so there it is. That's above uh, Twickenham. And uh, yeah, so uh, came down, uh, did quite a good job of uh, of being tracked, and it landed. So what did we collect? We went we went and found it. We'll say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but uh, here's some of the graphs that we we processed afterwards. So this was based on the actual data that it had stored on its SD card uh, rather than the data we got over the radio. Um, so you can see that the atmospheric pressure with time, uh, it was in the air for what, about uh, four hours, four and a bit hours. Um, and you can see that uh, as predicted atmospheric pressure, we went down to uh, a few thousand uh, kPa, sorry, a few thousand Pa. Um, atmospheric pressure versus altitude is quite a nice graph. But, um, obviously, so is quite a smooth um, drop in pressure. But that is actually two graphs because, of course, it went up and then it came back down again. So there are two different sets of readings superimposed on each other. So 
reasonably reproducible, which is always something nice to look for if you're interested in that kind of engineering. So the internal temperature, um, you remember we put it in a bottle so that it would hopefully be uh, um, stay warm enough to work. It obviously did work and the temperature inside that bottle didn't really go down very far at all. Um, it, uh, yeah, it dropped to about, I don't know what that is, uh, 15 or so centigrade. External temperature, a bit of a different story. Uh, we peaked at, uh, or lowest peak was uh, just over 55 degrees centigrade. So our predictions were pretty much accurate. And uh, we were very glad of the bottle and its, uh, it, its uh, thermal properties. So uh, yeah, quite pleased with that result. Altitude, as you can see, we got a little bit over 24,000 uh, uh, 24, meters, 24 kilometers. You can see it went up quite slowly and then it came down. The reason the curve of the descent is because this is a parachute, so it doesn't have much effect when there's no atmospheric pressure. Uh, there's no air to fight against the, uh, the parachute. And then as it uh, comes down, so the atmospheric pressure increases more air and the parachute has a bigger effect. So we were chasing after it. As I said, we, we left Oxford when we knew where it was, or roughly when it was going to land somewhere in London. And that's the reception that we received. So we were 22 kilometers away from it. Uh, as it came down, you can see this thing, it, the uh, 299 in the first message on the screen there, that's the meters above the ground. So it was, uh, um, uh, sorry, no, the 278 is the, is the height, then the 193 is the height, and then it got a bit confused. So we don't know what we actually received uh, as it went down so low that we didn't have a line of sight and we couldn't receive it. But you can see those last two um, prediction, uh, last sorry, last two latitude and longitudes. And uh, we could use those to predict where it was going to come down because we know the rate of descent. So I plugged everything into a bit of Excel. And we predicted that, uh, so that was the, the last actual flight received on that uh, HabHub tracker. And we predicted that it was going to land on this uh, byway um, road uh, somewhere along it. Uh, so we uh, we headed off in that general direction. And that is a, uh, a little Google uh, um, street view of that street. Uh, OK, I admit to doing this after the fact, but uh, that's what Google said the balloon should see. And there's the picture the balloon actually did see. So uh, there it was outside that house lying on the road. And luckily for us, a couple of cyclists came along. And again, the balloon took a picture of their, uh, their bicycle wheel as they said, oh, wonder what this is. Picked it up, saw my phone number, gave me a ring and... Uh, my husband and I, Paul, we were about 10 minutes away from it at the time. And they said, oh, we're just going to this place. So we'll meet you there. And uh, we've got it safe and sound. And uh, they were very nice. They wouldn't take the reward for it uh, as long as we uh, we explained it all to them and uh, um, put some details in our presentation about them. So uh, uh, they didn't want their photo in, but I do have photos and I was very uh, thankful to them for uh, collecting our uh, our balloon when it was on the ground. So uh, we felt that we uh, we should do it again. So here's some more pictures. These are just the highlights. Uh, this is um, you can see the the sun. We did it later in the day. The sun shining off some water there, uh, giving us a nice impression of the uh, the clouds and. Uh, there it is actually looking into the sun, but it was uh, getting a bit uh, later in the evening. I think that is uh, Coventry Airport. I don't think that's Bristol Airport. 
but uh, we we were okay on our flight path, so uh, they didn't compl- Nobody uh, was complaining about it, and we didn't go anywhere where we shouldn't have done. That was the last picture the uh, of the setting sun that the balloon took uh, while I was sitting in the field, and that was the picture I took of it when we found it in the field. It was quite dark at that point in time. Um, so uh, yeah, so there it is with its Raspberry Pi LEDs glowing somewhat demonically in the field. And uh, so we we picked it up and we took it home. Uh, on the way, of course, we stopped for a compulsory uh, meal out and some drinks and congratulate ourselves. And I'll leave you with that picture, which was on the uh, the second flight, which uh, I think is is rather a nice picture. Um, Lots of uh, visible countryside down the bottom and still got that lovely black of the edge of space. So, any questions? Well, thank you, Heather. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one watching this who's quite mesmerised by some of those pictures because somehow the rest all seemed not, not implausible, but you know what I mean. It just seemed, yeah, that's okay, and experimenting, putting this up, but suddenly you re- you have a feeling of just how high that really got so it's fantastic anyway uh, if you've been watching this at home and you've got any questions or comments now is the time to ask them if maybe you've done something similar or you've done some remote control type of um, you know, activities with this sort of thing with radios and uh, com- raspberry pies and things like that do get in touch now you can ask them either on youtube chat or batc messaging and please don't forget to include your first name and your call sign as well um, if you have one. So Heather, um, where do I start? Because I've got lots of questions. I've been scribbling them down here. Um, one of the things I was going to ask you was the weight, because you said you had to get a CAA approval for this. So I presume apart from that nylon cord, which had to be something specific, I presume there's a maximum weight as well, a payload that both the balloon would take and that you'd be allowed to fly. Yes, there is. Um, I can't actually remember off the top of my head what it is. There, there is a, if you just run, say, a PCB, so something that's very light without the bottle and the battery, with just maybe one battery, you can actually get the weight down low enough that you don't need to get CAA approval. Uh, but to run anything as complicated as, as our project here, yes, you, 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 you do have to meet the, the weight criteria. I think there's a maximum size of the balloon is 10 meters uh, at the bursting point so that was um that was why we picked that particular balloon with that those uh, dimensions and, and scale um i think we we were at 1.3 kilograms i think you can actually run up over three kilograms uh, before they start to to take an interest in it, but uh, what they're really worried about is is the size of the balloon. That that seems to be their their major concern, um, and uh, obviously the, that is dependent on when it's going to burst. So, if you're going to have a balloon burst of that diameter with a heavier payload, it'll burst lower down because the uh, the pressure will build up because you'll need more helium to get the same weight off the ground. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a question from Dave Odessa. At what height did you have the balloon tethered to the car, the Shepherd balloon? Um, there, there are maximum limits, again, set by the CAA, above which you have to have a, a, a flight licence for it. Um, we, uh, I think we actually, the highest we went to was, I think, 25 metres. But I think you're allowed 50 metres before you have to have a... Um, was it a a plan, a CAA approved plan for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael G6AQN uh, says, do you plan to add a pop the balloon uplink command? Uh, um, <laughs> we, we did actually have a, a, a silly idea with that, that we uh, we we could put a, um, a pin or uh, um, a spark plug or something like that um, uh, using hydrogen, but we didn't actually do any of that. Um, it, uh, it, it isn't really necessary to, 
to to have a pop command because it will pop eventually um as long as you've got enough helium in it and uh, so uh, yeah we, we we did think about doing it um we might we might do it for fun because we do have the low row uplink so uh, um we we did talk about other uplink things we um we thought about doing something so that we we could uplink people's call signs and then it would downlink them on the radio as a sort of thank you to them a little calling card from the edge of space kind of thing um so uh, yeah well, there are, there are fun things we might play with uh, with in, in in the uplink world yeah, that does sound fun. In fact, instead of pop, I wonder if you'll put something to keep the dog analogy going. Maybe you'll have claw or something like that. <laughs> it sounds likely, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It sounds, it just, I mean, so much fun, this sounds like. I mean, this, you talked about yourself and your husband doing this, but I guess there's several people probably involved with this because there seems to me a, a lot of skills, a lot of things to learn uh, and, you know, to, in, to build a project like this up over, well, a year or so at least. So, I mean, how many people were roughly involved with this? Um, if if you exclude all the people that did the, the commercial stuff, like David Ackerman, um, then there were four of us who did real work on it, uh, making antennas, um, specifying the balloon. I did most of the electronics and the software. Um, you saw uh, Ian holding the balloon early on, uh, friend Dave, who uh, did some of the tracking, um john alexander he was uh, he was very key with uh, a lot of the the momentum behind it all and uh, he did some of the uh, tracking as well so uh, yeah i think that i think there were six or seven people in cars uh, on the first one running around after it and they'd all been involved in some way or other um during during the project lifetime yeah, now I apologise if I missed this point. I did see a few um, kilometre things mentioned, but what was the range of the live transmission stuff that you had roughly between the balloon and, and Earth? What was the maximum range roughly? Um, well, there, there was that one um, up in uh, Northern Europe in North Netherlands. Uh, so at that point, I guess, it, I don't know how far the Netherlands is away, uh, three or 400 miles, I guess, uh, yeah. maybe more. Um, and the balloon was about 25 kilometres up. 25 kilometres, wow. And that's all on 10 milliwatts. Isn't that fantastic to think you could transmit that far? If only it was that easy on, on terra firma to transmit that far. Um, yeah. You know, with 10 milliwatts, none of us would need the linears and things like that at all to talk to the whole world. But no, it sounds a fascinating project. Now, you talked about, I can't let you go without... Um, talking about this new project because you've talked about having another version with maybe two cameras I think video as well yeah. I believe so how far is that plan progressing um, we've we've specified most of it um, and we bought some of the bits and uh, John Alexander is actually spearheading this one uh, he's uh, we've got the uh, um, uh, radiation sensor sorted out and we've uh, we've written some software to play with that, and we've got the Raspberry Pi uh, for the video camera bit sorted. We've designed up uh, this suicide thing, which is basically just effect with the uh, on the batteries, so that we can turn off parts of it completely, or we can turn parts of it itself off. In fact, um, and uh, yeah, we're basically we're, we're hoping in the next month or two to get somewhere, and then uh, over the the summer we'll uh, we'll get our application into the uh, CAA to get a, a flight plan. Well, I, I do hope that goes well. Do keep in touch with us because I think if you do this, and especially with some video, this will make a, an excellent follow-up to this webinar, Heather. Um, I think we've virtually covered most of the questions and things that we've had. I really want to thank you for bringing this to us now. It's a little bit different, you know. It's something, yeah, being a radio amateur will help to understand the, the radio aspects and maybe some of the other things like data and things but I mean combining them in such a fun project as well with this is really great I think one thing I must ask you just before we go though so nobody's worried at home you talk you you title this talk the sheep warrior were there any sheep worried by this in real life uh, there weren't we uh, um, we, we, want, we live on a farm here and uh, we ensured that all the sheep that um, may be in the area were um, they were actually owned by a local farmer, and we made sure that they weren't anywhere near us when we, uh, when we, or cattle, in fact, as well. So uh, no, there, there was, uh, 
there was no 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 sheep were harmed in the, in the making of this uh, this presentation. I think that's what I was getting to. Thank you very much indeed, Heather. Thank you. For a lovely, lovely talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now that concludes this webinar. And thanks once again to Heather Nichols, M0 HMO, and also to the RSGB team who helped put the series together behind the scenes. We hope you've enjoyed this tonight to date and that you'll be able to join us next time when Jack Purdom, W8TEE, and Al Peter, AC8GY, will join us live to talk about their high performance CW decoder project. If you'd like to see details of future webinars or watch recordings of previous programs in the series, please visit rsgb.org forward slash webinars, where you can also send us comments and feedback. And before I go, a reminder that the RSGB's annual general meeting 2023 will be live online from 10 a.m. on Saturday the 15th of April. As well as the results of the board director elections and the formal business of the AGM, there will be a review of 2022 by the RSGB president and a, present, and a presentation by the RSGB Propagation Studies Chair, Steve Nichols, G0KYA, who will talk about the, how the weekly propagation forecast is put together. Now, if you're an RSGB member, do use your vote in the elections. More details are on the RSGB website at rsgb org forward slash AGM. And finally, a tip that if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming Tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. So until next time, this is David G7URP signing off and clear. Bye-bye.